Welcome to Mission Gathering Charlotte. This community is for you. If you grew up in the church and have lost your faith, if you are in a moment of deconstruction or reconstruction, if scandals, politics, and hate have led you into doubt, if the stories of this faith raise doubts and curiosity in you, our time together is not about trying to fix you. You are not broken. Our journey in this life is not about erasing doubt but embracing them. For it is only on the darkest night we can see the stars. Life's journey is hard enough so we don't think you should have to make this journey alone. So if you are Asian, Latinx, Black or White, Indigenous, if you are male or female, trans or non-binary, if you are three days old, 30 years old or 103 years old, if you've never stepped foot in a church, or if you are Buddhist, Roman Catholic, agnostic or are a lifelong evangelical, if you are single, married, divorced, separated or partnered, if you are straight, gay, lesbian, asexual or bisexual, if you are a Republican, Democrat, independent, socialist or not registered to vote, if you have or had addictions, phobias, abortions, or a criminal record. If you own your home, rent, live with your parents, or are homeless. If you are fully abled, disabled, or a person of differing abilities. You are welcome to join us on this journey, to share our sacred meal at the Table of Grace, Happy Sunday, and welcome one and all. No conditions you are loved. We cannot say no You completely belong No, we cannot say it enough You are safe to be who you are No, we cannot say it enough So come to the table There is a place for you Come to the table Come to the table just as you are. No exceptions welcome home. We cannot say it enough. You're not on this road alone. No, we cannot say it enough. Nothing to prove you can let down your guard We cannot say it enough So come to the table There is a place for you Come to the table Come to the table Just as you are to the table there is a place for you come to the table there is a place for you come to the table just as you are just as you are just as you are there's no fear no fear in love There's no fear No fear in love You are safe to be who you are Nothing to prove you can let down your guard Come to the table, there is a place for you Come to the table Come to the table Just as you are And come to the table, there is a place for you Come to the table, there is a place for you Come to the table just as you are Just as you are Just as you are Just as you are 
just as you are. Everybody, Pastor Andrew here. I just want to say thank you for everybody who's been donating to us lately, who's been giving us gifts to help sustain things. We have a fundraiser coming up where we're going to have kind of a drag show. Well, not kind of, a drag show here at the church on May 19th. So if you want to buy some tickets to that, the um, tickets are on Eventbrite. If you search for God Save the Queens, uh, that's going to be our event to help try and raise money to get us through the summer and all the things that we have to do. And I don't know, maybe you want to give today just a gift today if, if that's something you've never done before, if that's something you're committed to doing. It helps us to, to keep going, to keep making this possible. So for the gifts that you've given, and for the gifts that we will receive, and for the fundraiser, it's going to be a blast. Let us pray this prayer of dedication and thanksgiving. Gracious, loving God, you've made all things. You've given us resources to share equitably among each other. Allow us to be a community that lives out that equity. To be a people who are generous with one another as you have been generous to us. In the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. Therefore get rid of all ill will and all deceit pretense, envy, and slander. Instead, like a newborn baby, desire the pure milk of the word. Nourished by it, you will grow into salvation since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now you are coming to him. As to a living stone, even though this stone was rejected by humans, from God's perspective, it is chosen valuable. You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. You are being made into a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Thus it is written in scripture, Look, I am laying a cornerstone in Zion, chosen, valuable. The person who believes in him will never be shamed. So God honors you who believe. For those who refuse to believe, though the stone the builders tossed aside has become the capstone, this is a stone that makes people stumble and a rock that makes them fall because they refuse to believe in the word. They stumble. Indeed, this is the end to which they were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who has called you out of the darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-10, through 10, the Common English Bible Translation. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this week's passage from 1 Peter, because remember, we're going through 1 Peter through this season of Easter, is mostly reworked quotes or allusions to quotes from the Hebrew Bible. And like out of the nine verses that are in our passage, six of those verses this week are, are those quotes or allusions that you can see on this graphic. And they're all calling back to the Hebrew Bible because the author wants to let this young church know, this, this first century church know, that in the Hebrew Bible you can see how God had done great things for the people of Israel in the past. And he wants to draw a parallel to the church as, as a new group that God is doing things with. Remember, we don't believe that the church is a replacement for Israel, but is a new family that God is bringing along as well. When I was younger, I grew up with a lot of pastors placing emphasis on the, the kind of weirder parts of this verse, right? The one that says we're, we're a new race, a holy people of kings and priests, royalty. And I guess that image is cool for some folks, but like I've never really been a fan of royalty. I mean, think about it. Think about what a royal is. The idea kind of creeps me out of it. Because like royals or, or despots or oligarchs or aristocrats, all these different groups, they find their identity in being above everybody else. Or they find their identity in excluding other people. Or their identity as being better than other people. And Jesus' message was, was more about the opposite, right? Jesus' message was more about our connection and our interdependence with each other. 
Jesus' message was about becoming servants to one another is how we lead and following his example. So I was really struggling with what I could say about this passage that's relevant to us. And then I asked myself, what were the intended roles of the royals in the Deuteronomic history or the Hebrew Bible, the part that talks about the kings? And what were the intended roles of the priests? In the Hebrew Bible, and at least like who they were supposed to be, right? Because if you read those, those those scriptures, they didn't really do what they were supposed to do. You see, the monarchies in both the United Kingdoms of Judah and Israel and the separate kingdom of Judah and Israel were a replacement for the period of judges, where God would call someone out from amongst the people to be a judge, to make judgments, to to help the people free themselves from whatever oppressive force was in the land. And so the monarchies, the, the royalty, they were supposed to be the ones that dealt out justice, that made sure people were treated, being treated equitably, that made sure that the laws that God had provided Moses were being followed so that there wouldn't be poor among them. And again, if you read the Hebrew Bible, none of the kings really did their job well. Saul and David were failures. And I know everybody talks about how David was so great if you grew up in the church, but if you read it, David's not a good character. He would have been canceled like 20 times over and probably in jail for most of the stuff he did. But their purpose was, was being judges. But their purpose was to be judges. That's what the royalty did. That's what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to support God's shalom, like the wholeness of the people amongst the people, to protect them from external threats and internal threats. And the priests, they had a role too. The priests were to proclaim the huge and big things that God had done through festivals, through reading of the word, through sacrifices, through bringing people together. Then they were to remind the people of the promises that the people have made to God and that God has made to God's people. And this role serves as a way of, of maintaining identity, maintaining your identity as a unique people group. It serves as a way of maintaining your identity as a religious group, of who you are in the universe and the cosmos. And by learning to live life together through religious practice and sharing amongst each other. So even though I don't want to be a king, and I don't really think you do either, and I don't really want to be a priest, I'm a pastor for a reason, but that's a whole other sermon. If I had to pick two things that are super important to community, like maintaining a community, even in the darkest of times, even in the hardest of times, I would say that those things would be making sure that everybody's being treated justly and equitably within the community. Like, truly making it a safe place for people to be. And then once you establish it as a safe place, the telling of our stories and the remembering of other people's stories and the remembering of our faith stories, of giving meaning to our lives, to finding bigger meaning in the things that are happening to us through the sharing of story. I think both of those things are super important. And both of those things help us to form and maintain our identity as a unique and separate community. At the start of our passage, we're told, therefore get rid of all ill will and all deceit, pretense, envy, and slander. Those are like five things, five toxins that can kill a community pretty quickly, right? If all you are is in comparison with each other, you get envy and it, it destroys and rots from the inside. And ill will and deceit and pretense, those things tend to separate us, keep us apart from each other. They don't create that safe space. But well, what's interesting is those five things are five tools that empire uses to build its power. It's how it builds its communities filled with injustice and disparity, filled with loss of story, loss of identity, to an amalgamation, a melting pot of a new identity that's only found in what the empire says it is. But all of us, me and you, we're in charge of keeping our new family just and equitable, keeping each other safe, being the people that show up for one another to keep each other safe. Forming and respecting each other's boundaries, we really have to practice good boundaries if we're gonna be a people that truly say they love each other. And the thing that we forget so often is that telling and proclaiming of our stories, of, of, of making the big stories a part of who we are, a part of how we interact with one another. Because it's in telling those stories that we remember who we are together. Because it's so easy to forget that we're in this together, isn't it? Because if we can be just and equitable to one another, 
we can practice boundaries, if we can tell our big stories, then our stories moving forward, the stories that will be told about us by those who come after us, don't have to be like Saul and David, who never lived up to their hype and never did what they were supposed to do for their people. It doesn't have to be like the sons of Eli, who stole from the people, who used their priestly status to take what wasn't theirs, to exploit others. Instead, maybe, maybe this new community that we're building, maybe this community that we're being called into, these living stones, this, this living temple that we're being built into, maybe it can be more like what Jesus describes, who saw the truest identity in this family as being servants to one another, as being servants to all, as, as being a people that would say, hey, I'll wash your feet, right? And that we don't literally have to wash each other's feet, but like showing up, being there for one another, or remembering what it's like to be a newborn. That separation between us is an illusion, and that, that my life and your life and the planet's life, of both flora and fauna, is bound up in all of this same web that we call life. Maybe if we can do that, maybe if we can do that, then there won't be so many people stumbling over rocks. And maybe if small communities can truly try to live this out, then we can bring the imagination and the knowledge to larger communities and to the world. So I guess my hope is that we may learn to be both protectors and proclaimers of the greatest story that another world is possible. That what is doesn't have to be what will always be. And that you and I are responsible in the greatest task imaginable in building this kingdom of heaven. Mission Gathering and Friends, may it be so. Amen.